أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين ثم الصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد ولعنة الله على أعدائهم ومنكر فضائلهم من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي السلام عليكم brothers and sisters ورحمة الله وبركاته I'd like to welcome you all to another session on the tafsir of Surah Al-Anbiya where we share some reflections on uh, on some of the ayat of the uh, of the surah alhamdulillah we reached ayah number 41 where allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says a'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem bismillah ar-rahman ar-rahim wa laqad istuhzi'a bi rusulin min qablik fa haqa bil ladhina sakhiru minhum ma kanu bihi yastahzi'un Allah says, messengers were certainly mocked before you. Then those who scoffed at them were surrounded by that which they used to mock. Surah Al-Anbiya, as we mentioned in the introduction, is a Meccan surah. And at this point in the Prophet's life, Rasulullah is facing extreme opposition. He's enduring both physical and verbal abuse from Quraysh. So you can imagine, and again, this is also a reminder that the Prophet ﷺ is a human being. You know, sometimes we tend to forget that the Prophet feels pressure. He feels the, the weight of, uh, of the resistance. He feels, you know, it, it hurts him when he's mocked, when he's ridiculed. And therefore you find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yet again in the Quran is consoling the Prophet. And what is, what is Allah essentially telling the Prophet? So you can imagine that at this point in the Prophet's ministry in Mecca, he's, he's been called a sahir. He's been called a magician. He's been called a poet. He's been called a, uh, a madman, a majnoon. He's been ridiculed and mocked. They've called him names. They've tried to undermine him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the Prophet, وَلَقَدِ اسْتُهْزِئَ بِرُسُلٍ مِّن قَبْلِكَ So the verse begins with a double emphasis. The lam is for emphasis. The word qad yufidu tahqiq. So there's so whenever you see the word laqad, it's it, it denotes double emphasis that this is something that is without a doubt. What is what is certain? What is without a doubt that past prophets, past messengers, they were all mocked. So Allah is essentially telling the Prophet that, O Muhammad, O my beloved Messenger, what you are experiencing is not unique. You are enduring the same hardship that every single Messenger endured. There is not a single Prophet or Messenger that has been sent that has not been mocked. So the, the norm, the unfortunate norm, is that the messengers before you were mocked. If you look at Surah Yasin, and there are many verses in the Quran where Allah speaks about the, the psychological abuse that the prophets faced. You know, it's one thing to be physically assaulted, but they were all mocked. They weren't taken seriously by people. And that's why in Surah Yasin, Ayah number 30, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And again, on the day of judgment, people will regret, you know, not paying, not paying heed to the, uh, the messengers. Allah says, Ya hasratan ala al-ibad. That the people on the day of judgment, they will be in a state of deep regret. They'll reg they will regret the way that, the, the re they will regret the way they responded and the way that they interacted and the way that they treated prophets and messengers. Ya hasratan ala al-ibad. And then Allah says, Ma yaatihim min, min rasulin Allah says there has not been a single messenger that has been sent, but they were mocked. So from the time of, you know, you take Nuh, Ibrahim, Ismail, Musa, they were all mocked. They were all ridiculed. So, so again, this is to remind the prophet that what you're going through is what previous prophets went through. So you're not alone. You know, this is something that all of the great messengers and prophets uh, had endured. And it does make it easier to handle knowing that it's not just you. You know, it's happened to all of these messengers before you. So what is the consequence? So Allah says, okay, you are being mocked. Past prophets were also mocked and ridiculed. What was the consequence? Allah says, فَحَاقَ بِالَّذِينَ سَخِرُوا مِنْهُمْ مَا كَانُوا بِهِ يَسْتَهْزِئُونَ You know, one of the things that communities, that people used to ridicule about the prophets is that, you know, because prophets were bearers of glad tidings and they were warners. And many prophets, they would warn their communities that if you continue in this behavior, if you continue living these lives of corruption, and injustice and immorality, that you will suffer divine punishment. You will suffer severe consequences. And many of these communities, they used to mock them. They used to say, oh, you know, if, if, if what you're saying is true, let us, you know, send down the punishment. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَحَاقَ بِالَّذِينَ سَخِرُوا مِنْهُمْ مَا كَانُوا بِهِ يَسْتَهْزُونَ فَحَاقَ the word haqa is an interesting word because the word haqa, if you look up, if you look it up in any Arabic dictionary, Lisan al Arab, whatever it may be, you'll find that haqa means ahata bihi. It's it's when something, it's when a calamity completely surrounds you and engulfs you. You know, the, the 52nd. Surah of the Quran is called Surah al haqqa So Haqqa is an Arabic word which essentially means a calamity that comes from the heavens, meaning that it comes unexpectedly and it encircles you. It completely consumes you and envelopes you. So Allah says, these people... And, and by the way, there, there are two words that are used here. Istihza, uh, which is to mock. You know, which comes from the word istihza, to mock. But when Allah speaks about those who taste the punishment, the punishment that engulfs them, the calamity, the divine wrath that engulfs them as a result of their actions, He says, فَحَاقَ بِالَّذِينَ سَخِرُوا مِنْهُمْ so there are two words in this ayah that we need to understand. The first is istihza, which is to mock. And then there's the word sukhriya. Now, there are different ways to mock. You know, someone might mock a prophet or mock a messenger privately. You know, they might, you know, roll their eyes. They might, they might do something subtle. So mocking doesn't really mention whether it's done in pro private or public. It's just general. But sukhriya is a very specific type of mockery, which, is, which means that sukhriya means that you are making an effort, a concerted effort to publicly humiliate someone. So there are, there are some people who might mock the prophet. They might ridicule him, you know, one-on-one. -on -one. Maybe they do it in private. But... 
الَّذِينَ سَخِرُوا مِنْهُمْ But those who engage in sukhriya are the ones who try to make a public spectacle of the Prophet. They try to publicly belittle him and humiliate him. And these are the people, they're both punished, but these are the people who receive the most severe chastisement because they're trying to publicly undermine the Prophet. They're trying to ruin the reputation of the Prophet. So Allah, about them, He says, فَحَاقَ بِالَّذِينَ سَخِرُوا مِنْهُمْ مَا كَانُوا بِهِ يَسْتَهْزِئُونَ That they will be surrounded by that which they mocked. So they used to mock and, and, uh, and ridicule this idea of being punished for their sins. Allah says, lo and behold, whenever they mock and they insult prophets, they are engulfed, they are surrounded by the very thing that they ridiculed, that they mocked. And again, this idea of being engulfed in, uh, in divine punishment is also alluded to in Surat Az-Zumar, Surah number 39, Ayah number 48. وَبَدَى لَهُمْ سَيِّئَاتُ مَا كَسَبُوا there, you know, Allah speaking about the, the, the disbelievers that it became apparent to them. Their sins became apparent to them. And they were encircled, they were engulfed by this the thing that they used to mock and ridicule. So this is a type of divine policy that when people make a mockery of the divinely appointed guides, prophets, the messengers, the imams, the punishment is, is so severe that it completely engulfs those who, who sought to publicly humiliate and, uh, and uh, you know, make a mockery of the, uh, of the messengers. Now, again, if you look at uh, Surah Fussilat, Surah 41, Ayah number 43, Again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in many verses, he, he does this where he, he tells the Prophet that what you're experiencing is what all Prophets experience. The, the insults that you're hearing were insults that were directed towards your predecessors. So for example, Surah Fussilat, Surah 41, Ayah number 43, مَا يُقَالُ لَكَ Allah says, there is nothing that these people can say to you that was not said to the prophets and the messengers before you. Meaning that history is simply repeating itself. They are saying to you what the disbelievers said to Musa. And they are, they're saying to you exactly what people used to say to Nuh and to Isa. So history again. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding us that you know, history repeats itself. If you go to Surah Hud, Surah 11, verse 120, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again mentions the reason why he, he brings the stories of the past prophets to the attention of Rasulullah. Allah says, وَكُلَّنْ نَقُصُّ عَلَيْكَ مِنْ أَنْبَاءِ الرُّسُلِ مَا نُثَبِّتُ بِهِ فُؤَادَكَ Allah says, all of these stories that I'm sharing with you, O Muhammad, whether it's the story of Yusuf, whether it's the story of Musa, of Zakaria, of Isa, of Ibrahim, of Nuh, I share their accounts with you. Why? To fortify your heart. To strengthen your heart. To make you steadfast. Because Allah doesn't want you to feel weak, to feel defeated. He wants you to feel confident. He wants to strengthen your heart. He wants to fortify your heart. And this is an important lesson for us, brothers and sisters. We have to draw inspiration from our predecessors. You know, when, when we're going through difficult times, one of the ways that we fortify our hearts, that we restore that sense of resolve and determination, we have to read about the experiences of the mu'mineen who came before us. Now, some people might say, okay, you know, these are prophets, these are imams, I can't be like them. 
You can read about the life of Abu Dhar. Was Abu Dhar Masoom? You could read about Salman al Farisi. You can read about the other companions of the Imams who also faced great hardship, who endured you know, great calamities. They faced great struggles. So in the same way that Allah reminds the Prophet that you're not alone, that we're, what you're going through now is what your predecessors also endured. We as, as believers, we have, to, we, have to empl- we have to employ the same approach if we want to fortify our hearts. We have to revisit history. We have to draw inspiration from, from our predecessors. And if we study the condition of the, 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 the communities before us, we'll discover that you know, we're going through a lot of the same things that they went through. And that should be a source of, uh, of inspiration for us. Ayah number 42, Allah says, so here, so again, Allah begins in ayah number 41, reminding the prophet that prophets before you were mocked, this is nothing new. So and Allah does this to strengthen the heart of the prophet. But now here, there's a call to action. Allah says, قُلْ So it's not enough to just feel confident. You have to say, you have to speak. You have to speak. You have to do something. Don't let their verbal abuse paralyze you. Do not allow them to to crush you. Don't feel defeated. Speak and speak confidently. What should the Prophet say to them? Allah tells the Prophet, tell them. And so Allah is getting to the heart of, Allah is essentially saying that, what, why are you so arrogant? What, is, what, is, what do you have that makes you so arrogant and so dismissive of my Prophet and my message? Allah says to the Prophet, say, who will protect you night and day from the beneficent? These mushrikeen, Quraysh, why are you people so arrogant? Do you really feel that safe and that strong and that powerful? Allah says, who, Allah tells the Prophet, who, say to them, who will protect you night and day from Ar-Rahman, from the beneficent? And then Allah mentions the, the reality of their problem. Why do they behave like this? Why are they so dismissive? Why are they so nonchalant? Why are they so hostile? Why are they so heedless? Allah says, nay, but they turned away from the remembrance of their Lord. So in this verse, there's an implicit reminder to the, to the enemies of the Prophet that Allah is aware of them and he has power over them by day and by night. Meaning that you, mushrikeen, you're, you have a false sense of security. You behave this way, you abuse, you oppress, you're arrogant. You have a false sense of security. Who will protect you? From who will protect you by day, not, uh, not night and day. Now here, night and day means around the clock, 24-7. The word yakla'ukum is probably a new word to many of you. The word yakla'ukum is the present tense form of the verb kala'a. And the word kala'a means to protect something or to guard something around the clock every single minute. You know, sometimes you might protect an object or a person, but you're not watching them every second. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is saying that who will protect you and guard you at every moment, night and day. And here again, night is mentioned before day because throughout the surah, you know, there's a, there's a consistency. Allah, when he spoke about the tasbih of malaika, he mentioned that they do tasbih in the night and in the day. So this consistency is maintained. Secondly, when you think about protection and safety and the need to be protected, 
you are most vulnerable at night. Because at night, you know, that's when most crimes are committed. That's when you're most prone to danger and attack. So Allah mentions night before day. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, who, and it's interesting, you know, when you read the verse, Allah says, Man min -Rahman. Who will protect you night and day from the beneficent? Now you, may, you may think to yourself that, why does Allah invoke this particular name? Why didn't Allah say, who is going to protect you night and day from Allah? Ar-Rahman is mentioned. Now, when you think of Ar-Rahman, you don't think of needing to protect yourself from the exceedingly merciful, because that's what Ar-Rahman means. So it's a bit strange at first glance when you read the verse, because the Prophet is instructed to tell the Mushrikeen, who will protect you night and day from the exceedingly merciful? It may seem like, like an oxymoron. However, the idea here is there are, there are two things that, uh, that we can uh, understand, at least two things. Number one is that Allah is not out to get you, meaning that Allah is not the type of Lord who is just looking to punish. Allah is not out to get the mushrikeen. Allah didn't create them because he wants to punish them. Allah is not out to get you. So this is number one, that Allah's, His nature is to be merciful. So number one, Allah is not out to get you. That's not His goal. Second, Allah wants them to understand that what you have done, your, your, your attempts to publicly humiliate the Prophet, your physical assaults, the fact that you've, you've, abused his companions, his family, is so egregious that the one who is exceedingly merciful has lost patience with you. So this is what the idea is, that Ar-Rahman, the exceedingly merciful, is going to punish you because what you have done is so such a great sin, such an egregious crime, that the one who is exceedingly merciful, who pardons and forgives, is prepared to punish you. Who is going to protect you? You're, you are small, helpless human beings. There are so many moments, so many seconds in the day when you're vulnerable, when you're not paying attention. Who is going to protect you from from the exceedingly merciful if he decides to punish you. But Allah says, Bel, no, the, the problem with these people, it's not that it's not that they have, you know, this impressive system of protection. They don't have this, you know, security detail or these uh, these protective measures. No, no. The problem is Belhum an dikri rabbihim mu'ridun. The problem the arrogance that they have, it doesn't come from the fact that they're a superpower or, you know, they have, you know, all of these, you know, mechanisms of protection. They have nothing. They're, this is all coming from what? From the fact that they are heedless of who Allah is. This is where it comes from. Because someone who truly knows Allah would never be arrogant. Arrogance is a sign that someone is just completely disconnected. They're heedless of Allah. I'raz. Bel hum an dhikri rabbihim mu'ridun. Mu'ridun is, uh, it's not a verb. It's a noun. Ism fa'il, mu'ridun. Meaning that this quality of turning away from the truth is so deeply rooted that it's, it's become a character trait. It's not just an action. It's, it's become embedded in them. I'raz. I'raz is to deliberately turn away from something. To not even consider it. To just turn away as if it's nothing, as if it's not important. 
And look at the sentence structure. You know, normally in the Arabic language, you have subject, you have predicate, and you have what is associated with the predicate that comes after. Here, so normally, so if so, the ayah says what? Bel. If you look at the mushaf, bel hum an dhikri rabbihim mu'ridun. Normally, the sentence would be structured in the following way: bel hum mu'ridun an dhikri rabbihim. Hum, subject, mu'ridun, the predicate, an dhikri rabbihim, so that. So why 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 is the sentence structure changed? So if I translate the ayah the way that it we find, see it in the Quran, it essentially says, "Bel nay, they are from the remembrance of their Lord, heedless." Normally, the verse would say what? Normally, you would expect the ayah to say, "Bel hum mu'adilun an dhikr rabbin." Nay, they are heedless of the remembrance of their Lord. What's the difference? The reason why the ayah is the way that it is, where the predicate is all the way at the end, بَلْهُمْ عَنْ ذِكْرِ رَبِّهِمْ مُعْرِضُونَ And the, the, uh, the muta'allaq of the, uh, the khabar, so you, you have mubtada, subject, and khabar, predicate. Because the predicate was was put at the end, and an dhikri rabbihim is is put ahead of it, it denotes ikhtisas exclusivity. And what Allah is trying to say is that they are only heedless of their Lord, meaning they are very attentive about everything else. Only when it comes to Allah, they're heedless. You ask them about the economy, they know what's going on. They're very attentive. You ask them about, about anything else, anything else, and they're very attentive. They're very detail-oriented. But when it comes to Allah, Allah is something, it's, it's not even a priority. It's not even on their list of priorities. And we have many people who are like that today. So even though Allah is speaking about mushrikeen and the, the enemies of the Prophet, some of us, we have these tendencies in us where we are cognizant of everything, we are attentive to everything except Allah. Allah is the only thing that is on the back burner. You ask someone about the stock market, they know what's going on. They're, they're on top of things. You ask them about the NBA, you ask them about the NFL, they know all of the stats, and they can break it down to you like it's a science. But when it comes to Allah, no. But when it comes to their Lord, they're heedless. He's the last thing on their mind. Ayah number 43. Again, Allah is putting his, he's pressing on, on the issue of what is making them so arrogant, so insolent. So obnoxious. Allah says, or do they have gods? Does their insolence and their obnoxiousness and their hostility and, the, and their arrogance, does it come from the fact that they believe that they have gods? Or do they have gods? to defend them apart from us, they cannot help themselves. Meaning the idols that you worship, they can't even help themselves. Nor are they given protection against us. Now again, Allah is talking about mushrikeen, polytheists. They believe that they're Idols offered them a type of security, a type of protection. And Allah says, these things that you worship, they can't even protect themselves. You have a false sense of security. Now today, most people don't worship idols. They don't worship idols made out of stone or wood. But what do we worship? You know, maybe we, we might not say it. 
We might not even realize it, but many of us, you know what we worship? We worship, you know, democracy. We worship, you know, capitalism. We worship, you know, the strength. We worship our economy. We, we, we have so much faith in institutions that are man-made and we feel a sense of security. Many, many countries, they, they feel that they can do whatever they want because they have the most powerful military, because they have the most robust economy. Those man-made institutions, those isms, right? You know, whether socialism, communism, capitalism, liberalism, whatever it may be, you, you, you add the label, you add whatever ism you want. These isms have essentially become our modern day idols, where we feel a sense of protection and security under them. Allah here is saying that no, nothing, nothing, none of these things can protect you. The only thing that offers real protection is Allah. The only being that has the ability to give you true stability is Allah. So having faith in anything, any man-made institution and seeing it as being independent and able to grant security and protection independent of Allah, this is foolish. Allah says, or do they have gods to defend them apart from us? They cannot help themselves, nor are they given protection against us any superpower in the world you can have the the most sophisticated military you can have the best technology all allah azza wa jal has to do is what he sends a hurricane to completely wipe out half of the population and then what one allah just brings one natural disaster and you're finished so Allah is saying that you, you have this false sense of security. You have faith in things that, that don't have the power to do anything. Suhba. Suhba, you know, is like companionship. You know, usually when, when you have friends and you get into a, a scuffle with someone, you have an altercation with someone, you know, what do your friends usually do? You know, they have your back. You know, they step in, they defend you. If you get pushed or shoved, your suhba, your friends, your, your buddies, they jump in and they protect you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, again, this is figurative, that you will not be, you know, your companions, your friends, whether they are idols or their institutions, they're not going to be able to intervene when I decide to punish. And then Allah says in ayah number 44, again, going back to this idea, why are these people behaving like this? Allah then he says, Allah says, perhaps, nay, but we, ha we granted enjoyment to them and their fathers till life grew long for them. Maybe it's because Allah has given these people riz, he's, been, he's given them health and wealth and prosperity, and they li they've lived long lives. Maybe that has deluded them into thinking that they are recipients of divine favor. Allah says, do they not consider how we come upon the land, reducing it of its outlying regions? Is it they who shall prevail? So the idea here is that there are some people who defy the prophets, who ridicule the prophets, who stand in opposition to the prophets, because they have this false sense of being in, in a state of divine favor. Because, you know, they look around, okay, I'm insulting this prophet, I'm ridiculing him. 
nothing's happening to me at the moment. I'm healthy. I have money. I've lived a long, prosperous life. This sometimes deludes them into thinking that, that everything is good. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Ali Imran, ayah number 178, and this is the ayah of, of the Quran that Sayyidah Zainab recited to Yazid. Because Yazid killed Imam al Hussein, and he sees that it's done. He's gone. I'm still the Khalifa, and as far as he could see, He's living in his palace comfortably. So where is this divine punishment? You know, if if I was wrong, if I was in the wrong, if what I did was evil, then surely God would punish me immediately. She says to him that, have you not read what Allah says? The disbeliever should never assume that when Allah gives them time, He gives them respite, that it's for their own good. No, it's not. That Allah gives them time so they can increase in sin. So they can increase in sin because Allah wants you to reach your full potential, whether it's good or whether it's evil. He wants you to take it to the extreme he wants you to he wants your soul to reach fruition whether it's good or evil he wants it to come to fruition he wants you to to uh, to develop to reach the the end point that you choose so allah says i grant them respite i grant them time so that they can increase in sin and for them is a humiliating punishment. In Surah Al-A'raf, Surah 7, Ayah 182, بِآيَاتِنَا Those who reject our signs. You know, and, and we see this all the time. You see the most wicked people, they're living luxury, they're living comfortable lives. I mean, they're, they're living very comfortable lives. And you think to yourself that, you know, where is Allah's justice? You have good people who suffer and you have evil people who are living it up. Allah says, no. Allah says, I will lead them on little by little and they will commit more and more sins and more crimes. So in that life, in the next life, when they stand before me, their punishment will be very severe. So Allah says, I, I don't give them because I'm rewarding them. In fact, I'm punishing them through the things that you think are blessings. Allah says, they're not blessings. These are punishments disguised as blessings. And when Allah says, when he speaks about, when he says, do they not consider أَفَلَا يَرَوْنَ أَنَّا نَأْتِيَ الْأَرْضَ نَنْقُصُهَا مِنْ أَطْرَافِهَا Do they not consider that we are shrinking the earth from its edges. What does this mean? It means time is running out. Yes, you're enjoying your life. You're living in luxury. But time is running out. Those who are suffering, their time is coming to an end. And those who are enjoying also, they're coming to their end. And we are all returning to Allah. You know, that's why Imam al-Kadhim alayhi salam, he used to say to Harun al-Rashid that for every day that I endure the suffering in the prison, you know, so, so, for, so, so every day that I draw closer to my death, you're also drawn closer to your death. So with every day that is deducted from my life when I'm in prison, one day is deducted from your life, O oh Harun, when you're sitting in the palace. We're all moving towards this final end. In Surah Ar Ra'd, Surah number 13, Allah says, So one of the meanings of the you know the earth shrinking uh, in by its edges is that time is running out, that death is coming. And it can also mean that punishment is coming. Punishment in this life is coming. 
Surah Al-Ra'ad, ayah number 31. وَلَا يَزَالُ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا تُصِيبُهُمْ بِمَا صَنَعُوا قَارِعَةٌ أَوْ تَحُلُّ قَرِيبًا مِنْ دَارِهِمْ حَتَّى يَأْتِيَ وَعْدُ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُخْلِفُ الْمِعَادِ And those who disbelieve, calamity will never cease to befall them because of that, because of that which they used to do. And the calamity will come close to their home. Meaning that sometimes we have to take lesson. You know, we see calamities descending on people around the world. And we have to also remember that maybe these hardships and these calamities will come knocking on our door. You know, even, even the word qari'ah means, you know, uh, to knock, qara'ah. But it's, it's a type of calamity that has come directly to your doorstep. And the, you know, one of the things that the mushrikeen feared was the, was the Prophet conquering Mecca. So, you know, and this is interesting because when the Prophet, وآله, when he conquered Mecca, this was essentially they felt like the earth was shrinking in on them. That now the conquest, what they feared the most, has now come to their doorstep. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, do they not consider how we come upon them, how we come upon the land, reducing it of its overlying, of its outlying regions, so this is a reminder that time is limited, that what you fear is closing in on you. And then ayah number 45, and we'll conclude here. قُلْ So again, the Prophet is mocked, he's ridiculed, but Allah wants the Prophet to maintain his composure, that speak confidently, be merciful, do not be shaken, do not feel weak, do not feel defeated. Stand firmly and say the following to these to these adversaries. قُلْ إِنَّمَا أُنذِرُكُمْ بِالْوَحِي وَلَا يَسْمَعُ الصُّمُّ الدُّعَى إِذَا مَا يُنذَرُونَ Say, O Muhammad, I warn you through a revelation, but the deaf do not hear. They do not hear the call, however much they are warned. قُلْ إِنَّمَا أُنذِرُكُمْ بِالْوَحِي The Quraysh, the Mushrikun, they used to always ask the Prophet, perform this miracle, perform that miracle. Do this, do that. We won't believe you until you perform this specific mu'jiza. Allah tells the Prophet, tell them, I warn you only through revelation. قُلْ إِنَّمَا أُنذِرُكُمْ بِالْوَحِي this shows you the power of the Qur'an. That Qur'an is enough. I warn you using nothing but the Qur'an. And the Qur'an is enough. If you are a truth seeker, the Qur'an is sufficient. So Allah again is telling the Prophet that the problem is not with the message. You're not being ridiculed because your message is silly. You're not being ridiculed because you're not delivering the message properly. The product, if I want to use you know, business terms, there is nothing wrong with the product. The user is at fault. There's nothing wrong with the message. The recipients of this message, they're the ones who are. There's something wrong with them. Say, I warn you through a revelation, but what's the problem? وَلَا يَسْمَعُ الصُّمُّ الدُّعَى The problem is that the listeners, those who are listening to Revelation, they're deaf. They're spiritually deaf. They might be able to hear you with their ears, but they're deaf. So, O Muhammad, continue preaching the message. The problem is not with the message. Those who are listening to you have spiritual illnesses. They are spiritually deaf. And you cannot, uh, you cannot warn someone who is spiritually deaf, who has chosen 
to be spiritually deaf. And this is a reminder, brothers and sisters, that, you know, sometimes, you know, we try, we, we look for inspiration here and there, you know, we might read this book or that book. But believe me, brothers and sisters, the Quran is sufficient for us. You know, sometimes we belittle the Quran. We try to find answers. We try to find solace. We try to find inspiration in every book other than the Quran. We have to value this book because Allah tells the Prophet, "Qul innama unzirukum bil wahid." I warn you, using an innama again, it's a word that conveys exclusivity. I warn you exclusively through the Quran, through revelation. We have to appreciate Wahi because it is the source. It is the source of our inspiration. It is the source of our strength. You can imagine the Prophet is being insulted. He's being attacked. He's being bombarded. And Allah is telling the Prophet, stick with Wahi. Stick with Wahi. The answers are in Revelation. And we as Muslims, if we want to confront the challenges that we face, we have to come back to the Qur'an. We're not going to find the answers anywhere else. Say, I only warn you with revelation. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to make us appreciate the blessing of wahi, the blessing of revelation. We ask Allah to make us among those who seek solutions to our problems in the Quran. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to honor us with the shafa'a of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad wa akhir da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallallahu ala Muhammad wa alihi al-tahirin Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad ajjal fa'ilihan Any questions or comments? It's just a, a comment it's about it. It's interesting that even the last verse and verse 42 both seem to really talk about how the main source of people turning away from Allah and, and their, uh, their rejection of this is that they are really not even thinking about God and not even taking this thing seriously or considering it. Yeah, it, it is. I mean, I mean, and, and the, the word mu'aridun really says it all. I mean, it, it's one thing to kind of consider something and then you say, okay, I, I, I looked at this, I studied this, and it's not for me. But to just not even care. I think the problem with many people is that there are many people who go through life and they don't even ask the most fundamental questions like, why do I exist? Where, what is the origin of the universe? Do I have a purpose? Does the universe have a creator? And you know, people will study the most random things. They will spend hours and hours and they will give attention to the most, to the most trivial things. They'll pay attention to, I mean, just like the Quran says, they'll pay attention to everything, but they will turn away from God as if, as if it's just not important, you know. And I think this really, that, that part of the ayah, for me at least, I feel it just, it summarizes the state of modern man. You know, we're concerned about the newest device, about the economy, about this and that. Not that those things are not important, but where is Allah in all of this? You know, we, we really, I mean, if you, even if you watch, you know, sometimes I sit and I watch documentaries about the planet. You know, you have some of these documentaries about the mountains and about, you know, these uh, documentaries about the animals and the, the life forms that are found in the oceans. There's not a single mention of God. You, you could sit and watch a two-hour documentary about the universe. And it's just, Allah is just not in the equation. And I just think that that part of the ayah, I mean, it's, 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 they, won't, they won't even consider it. It's just, it's a complete write-off. Like, it's not even important. It's, we're not even going to consider it a deliberate you know, to deliberately turn away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I think is this, the sad state of, of many people in the world. So, Hassan, I, I think that's a very important observation. I think that that, uh, the, that 
part of the verse about people just deliberately turning away from God is uh, it's a very telling uh, verse. Um, and and uh, related to the verse from uh, Surah Al Imran, it said, and uh, we extended them, uh, extended it for them so they may increase in sin. Uh, looking at the next verse, it, it says that Allah would not leave the believers in that state until he separates the evil from the good. Uh, do you feel like this, the extension is also partially so that uh, other believers can identify, hey, these people like Yazid, for example, like the, the good people from the bad people? So uh, I, I think you cut off uh, a little bit. So you're referring to Surah Ali Imran, verse 178? Uh, yes, one cent, one, the, that verse, and then the, at least uh, just looking at it, it kind of seems to imply that maybe part of the reason why their extension uh, occurred is so that Allah doesn't leave the believers in the state in which they are right now until he separates the evil from the good. Potentially so. Let me just, uh, let me just look up the ayah. Uh, That's a good point. I think that's a good observation because if you think about it, so I, I, think, I think you hit the nail on the head because when Allah leaves oppressors to, uh, to themselves, meaning he allows them to live, what typically happens is they become even more rebellious. When evil intensifies, it becomes a very prime testing ground for the mu'mineen. And Allah is able to kind of separate the real believers from you know the fake believers, so it, so I, I think you make a good point. So it's it's Allah's way of kind of you know weeding out the elite from the mediocre, you know weeding out the true mu'minin from those who are just mu'minin by name. Um, and another question: uh, So istahza is common in society, even in mu'minins. Do these verses also give a line of action for that? Can, can you repeat the first part of the question? The, this question starts up saying, so istahza, I-S-T-A-H-Z-A, is common in society. Oh, istihza, istihza. Okay. Istihza. Uh, it's common in society, even in Mominins. Do these verses also give a line of action for that? So, if, if you're ridiculed, now again, what I, what I understand, just as a personal reflection, is that if you're being ridiculed, you know, no, number one, your first question should be, did I conduct myself inappropriately? Meaning, am I deserving of this kind of criticism? You know, we shouldn't automatically, you know, uh, assume that we're victims and, you know, you know. so first we have to ask, are we conducting ourselves? I apologize, uh, Sheikh, but would you mind defining istahza? Because I actually don't know that word. So istihza means mockery to make fun of so if someone makes fun of you or ridicules you you know you, you should it's, it should be a moment of of introspection you know the prophet was ridiculed and we know the prophet was infallible but sometimes we might interpret constructive criticism as you know i'm being mocked or i'm being ridiculed so we have to keep that in mind if you've conducted yourself according to the values of Islam, and you're still being mocked, at that point, you have to leave it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the sense that you shouldn't descend and lower yourself and, and retaliate by also mocking. So if you notice, the Prophet was mocked. He doesn't respond by mocking the, the mushrikeen. He responds... By, he responds very confidently. He maintains his, uh, his, uh, his merciful temperament. And he dismantles the, uh, you know, uh, the position of his, uh, of his adversaries. So the, course are, the, the, the action plan, when we are subject to, to mockery and criticism, first we have to ask, are we at fault? We shouldn't automatically assume that we're victims. You know, sometimes we bring mockery onto ourselves. You know, we are ridiculed and sometimes we're deserving of the ridicule because we haven't 
conducted ourselves in a way that the Prophet would be pleased with. But let's assume that no, we we've we've uh, we've behaved morally. We've we've held ourselves to uh, the Islamic standard, and we're still being mocked and ridiculed. This is where you have to leave justice to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You let Allah deal with it. You respond. You don't let it shake your confidence. You remain confident because if you're, if you're doing what is pleasing to Allah, that should be the source of your self, uh, your sense of worth, your self-esteem should be drawn and derived from your relationship with Allah. You should also be merciful, meaning do not retaliate when you're mocked. You know, you have to maintain that dignity, that mercy, that confidence. And, uh, and yeah, and don't, don't descend, don't, uh, you know, don't lower yourself and engage in that type of behavior. You see that when the Prophet is mocked, Allah tells him, Qul, say this, say that. But Allah never tells the Prophet to mock them back. So if, if people make Islamophobic comments at us, we don't retaliate by you know, name calling. You know, that's not what we do. We maintain our composure. We have to ask, did we do anything that warrants this type of criticism, this type of ridicule? That's the first question. And secondly, if, if, if it's yes, then we have to adjust our behavior. If the answer is no, we remain firm on our path and we say, we leave them to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, follow up to the previous question about the mocking. Um, in, in these verses, Allah is asking the Prophet to respond back to people in a specific manner. Is that manner meant to be an example for us when we're uh, dealing with this in society today and from other Muslims even? No. It really depends. I mean, I, I don't think that we can give, you know, a one size fits all kind of answer. You know, it depends on, on, the, on the situation. So, you know, if, if Islam is being mocked, it's definitely the responsibility. You know, I, I don't believe that it's everybody's responsibility, for example, to speak to the media or to say something. You know, there are certain people in the community who are knowledgeable, who are articulate, who should have the microphone. You know, the problem is a lot of times we think that to engage, to be active means that I have to have the microphone. That's not the case. You know, if we're talking about, you know, Islam being uh, undermined, people making uh, derogatory or they're denigrating our faith, faith leaders, ulama, scholars, those who have the ability to kind of articulate a response should be at the forefront. But, but what we can do is if you're not the person holding the microphone, you should support those, support organizations, support people who are at the forefront dealing with uh, the misconceptions, dealing with uh, the, uh, the challenges of, uh, of Islamophobia. So it doesn't mean that every single person needs to directly engage the uh, the an, an adversary. Sometimes, you know, there are certain people who just have to remain silent because if they talk, they're going to do more damage. So I think it, it really depends. It's a, it's a case by if it's not on an individual level, it depends on who the person is. You know, if you're being mocked by a relative, it's it's different than being mocked by someone at the grocery store. You know, sometimes you just have to turn the other way and just ignore. You know, other times. You know, this is someone that you're living with or you're interacting on a daily basis with, then maybe you need to kind of nip it in the bud. You have to kind of address the issue in a more direct way if, if it warrants that or maybe do it indirectly. So it really depends on the situation. But the point is that when, when Muslim, when, you know, when the Prophet, when Muslims are targeted, when they're insulted, when they're mocked, our ethics, our morality does not permit us to just, you know, you know, launch insults back at people. That there has to be a difference between us and them. You know, even though many people try to argue that oh, we're just like everybody else. I don't believe in this whole, whole we're just like everybody else. No, we Muslims have to hold ourselves to a 
much higher ethical standard. So the, the really the underlying message is that don't feel defeated, don't feel insecure if, you, if we're attacked as a community, because again, it happened to the Prophet, it happened to the early Muslims. We have to respond in a dignified way, in, in, a, in a logical way. We shouldn't let emotions drive our, our, uh, our narrative. And we have to kind of, uh, we shouldn't descend into this, uh, this world of name calling and, and mockery and ridicule. We have to maintain uh, uh, akhlaq, even when we're dealing with uh, the enemies of Islam. Uh, and, uh, thank you. And in order to help us uh, learn from the history of the companions, uh, do you have any sources that you would recommend for us to learn about the, their history? Um, when it comes to the companions, again, I've, I'm not, I don't really read Islamic books in English, but uh, there's a book about the, uh, the Prophet's biography. It's translated into the English language, and it does make mention of, uh, of some of the, uh, the, uh, the incidents, the stories of, uh, of some of the noble companions, uh, a restatement of the history of Islam and Muslims. It's a very thick book on the biography of the Prophet. And it does mention uh, some of the noble companions of the Prophet and their stories. But again, I would have to, I would have to look into it. I, I'm not really familiar with uh, the English literature. But I'm sure you can fi probably find stuff online, you know, just kind of search for, you know, if you go to alislam.org, I believe they have a lot of resources. You know, read about Salman, about Abu Dhar, about Maqdad, about, you know, these uh, individuals. Even you read about ulama, it doesn't even have to be about uh, companions, you know, sometimes read about our own scholars, you know, some of the things that they faced and, uh, you know, their, uh, their noble stands when they, uh, when they, uh, when they faced hardship. Okay, thanks. And, and um, this question is more about the grammar uh, in verse 41. Yes. Uh, is this first specifically referring to punishment that is faced by the the Surya, the the ones who are publicly mocking the prophet and not mockers in general? Because it, it seems to say that just the public mockers will be punished. It's it's hard to tell. I mean, if, if just looking at the verse, وَلَقَدْ اسْتُهِزِئَ بِرُسُلٍ مِنْ قَبْلِكَ, the fa gives an indication that it might be it might be both. Because it could be that these specific people who are mocking were also those who were mocking publicly. So they were mocking, you know, perhaps in private, but what really made the, them incur the wrath of God was they, they just made it, you know, a public campaign. You know, they tried to publicly humiliate the uh, the messenger and destroy his credibility. So uh, yeah, it, it could it could be both. It could be both. But generally, just from a linguistic perspective, suhriya it, it refers to those who are making, you know, uh, uh, they're publicly denigrating someone. Whereas uh, istihza doesn't have that same connotation. Yeah, thank you very much, Sheikh. This this uh, message of really uh, of remembering Allah all the time is a really really good one to kind of keep in mind. Um, Alhamdulillah, I agree. I agree. Inshallah, Allah makes us among those who are mindful of Him in in a world that is drowning in a state of ghafla, drowning in a state of uh, of heedlessness. May Allah protect us, Inshallah.